All, All right. right. Back this to the week, 270 Winchester. This is developed in 1923, and it debuted in 1925 for the Model 54 bolt-action rifle. Right. This is from Winchester. Now, the same year the Model 54 was offered in 7x57, which is the 7mm Mauser caliber. So this was kind of the Americanized version. Now, Jake, give us some more details. Yes. They were both debuted the same year in the Model 54, which was the prerequisite to the Model 70 bolt action. Right. 54 is beautiful bolt action rifles, but they're yeah. older. They're older. They made some, they made some uh, refinements to come up with the Model 70, but but let's talk about this some more. Well, so this, why, why so was, this was in 1925, these two calibers came out in this yeah. rifle. Tough time. Tough time, exactly. Well, there was such a strong anti-German sentiment in the nation. Just, you know, basically just got out of World War One. Yeah. Still things happening in Europe. A lot of people and it was that a, just saw the world and came home with a brand new uh, spirit of adventure. They were happy to be home and wanted to hunt and uh, learn how to shoot rifles good. Right. So and now they've got a German, European metric round in this American rifle. No, it didn't. Doesn't and there make, was... Doesn't make American sense. It was just... It, it didn't take off. So the 270 did. Well, the 270 didn't really either. Not yet. Not yet. It took a couple years, um, but we're going to get to that. Okay. What was the case based on? Well, a lot of people think the 270 is actually based on a 30 out 6 case. Hmm. But it's not. What is it? It's based on the 3003 case, Ah. which was a couple years before the 30 out 6. It's actually. Hence the 03 as opposed to 06. It is uh, point. Zero five zero of an inch longer the case is than the thirty odd six. Okay. So it, it's it's a it's a tad longer of a case for the cartridge. Okay. Probably prevents it from being fed in the most thirty odd sixes having a longer case. Uh, it depends on if it's the neck or the shoulder. If the shoulder's the same, it would fit, but that would be not smart. So, anyways, back to back to this. Okay. So that, uh, case length it matters at the shoulder, but it, because it's a smaller bullet, it would still fit in. Okay. So I'm sure there's some modifications. Now, uh, the original 270 from the factory, the only bullet offered was a hundred and 130 grain bullet. It was a round. It was a, a soft point bullet. Sure. And they claimed it had a velocity of uh, over 3,000 feet per second, uh, more about 3,150 feet per second. Well, it's a, it's a. Back even then, the seven millimeter was a very good long range gun. Yes, and this was the American equivalent to it, or it surpasses it. And uh, optimum bullet size, optimum bullet weight. Um, once and now with today's technology, with VLD technology, very low drag. Goodness, these are accurate guns. And the Winchester had claimed because at the time it was a Winchester gun. Winchester was making the ammunition for it. Sure, uh, they marketed it as being capable to take game. Up to 1,000 yards away. I believe it. Probably smack antelope at that range with this Probably. Gun. Now, it wasn't, like you said, it wasn't really popular for a few years. This was because there were so many, there was such an abundance of sporterized 03 Springfields from World War One. Sure. There was there was millions of these. And back then, these guys were using 3040 Craigs right. and using Winchester 1895s. There was a lot of big guns back then. There was a lot of them. Yep. Uh, even 405 Winchesters. Right. And 4570s left over from the Civil War. Because it was only, you're only talking, you know, 65, 70 years before that. So those guns were still in the market. There were still people shooting black powder back then pretty heavily, I imagine. I would imagine so. Yep. And Exactly. I mean, think about the era. I mean, that's almost 100 years ago right now we're talking. So uh, 90 years ago. So that's pretty amazing. Okay, so... So there was so much abundance... um, Of the sporterized guns. The sporterized guns. And one of the big reasons was that the military had just posted all these new chronograph results at the time. Military was the only one that had a chronograph, and they... Say they tested the 270 and the 30 out six, and they showed the 30 out six being so much of a faster, stronger cartridge. Hmm. Because 30 out sixes were made at the government facilities. Oh, sure. So no, the government always tells the truth, Jacob. Right. Well, except for back then, <laughs> they do now, but back then they didn't. Um, but one gun writer in particular claimed the military was lying. 
He said that the military had a chronograph and that the 30 odd sixes that they were shooting for testing had barrels that were so much longer than the 270s. Basically, a custom gun made just for making the chronograph numbers exactly. look good. Exactly. So, so they were. Uh, they kind of had a dragster at a stock car race. Exactly. Okay. Well, this gun rider was Jack O'Connor. All right. He had purchased a Model 54 Winchester in 270 the year they came out in 1925. Okay. After shooting it and realizing what it had the capabilities of, that's when he kind of started having this fight with the government in the 30 out 6 saying their ballistics are flawed. Well, the, you know, I would imagine if that was the, the 30 out 6 was the gun of choice for the military at that time, which it was, yep. they don't want anything to think that it's being outdone. They exactly. want to keep the genre of... You know, join the army, join whatever, and have the strongest weapons available. But here the 270 was a little bit flatter shooting. Not more powerful, but flatter shooting. Right. Flatter shooting and somewhat faster. Right. Now, they still credit, and I, I, I feel that probably Winchester owes him a lot, of the success and the general acceptance of the 270 to Jack O'Connor. Sure. That's every time they're synonymous. Right. Now... Like we said before, the 270 is actually a little bit longer than the 30 out 6. But if you look at the ballistics of the 270 today, these are some of the the caliber weights for the bullet. Caliber weights? Meaning bullet weights. Bullet weights, okay. Bullet weights go anywhere from 110 grain up to 150 grain. Those are kind of the standards. You okay. can buy the bullets heavier and handle them yourself, but these right. are your factory offerings. Right. Now... Let's take the, the standard 130 grain soft point uh, Hornady round currently in production. Sure. Uh, they say that the muzzle velocity is over, th it's 3,060 feet per second. Okay. Well, the energy it produces is 2,700 foot pounds of energy. <laughs> wow. That's 2,300 feet, foot pounds of energy more than a 45 does at the muzzle. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, that's a lot of A lot energy. more powder in this thing, too. Yeah, yeah. So what happens? Now, at uh, they say 500 yards, it drops about 40 inches. That, which is great. Which is it, very I mean, great when you look at some of the heavier... The, basically the, take a yardstick and put it above the deer, pull the trigger, and, exactly. you know, and you drop them. If you're zero, it didn't, you know. So that's, uh, that's not bad at all. They say it's ideal to be zeroed in at 200 yards with this cartridge. Oh, I bet. Now... Uh, let's say you want the heavier option. Maybe you're going to go for a little bit bigger game. Uh, let's take the Federal Premium Ammo. Yeah. They have a 150 grain round nose soft point bullet. That classic. Yeah, just it big looks like round a round nose. Round. Yep. We've got some of these at home. We do. They, they do look good. Good looking round. Now, muzzle velocity, it's actually not that much less. You're only at about 2,800 feet per second. So you're only dropping 200 feet per second there. Yeah. Which, in the grand deal of things that's not much at all for this and the energy at the muzzle is still tremendous it's 2,600 foot pounds of energy so actually the lighter bullet the 130 grain bullet hits harder and goes faster it does so uh so if you were you know picking the sports car out that might be the one to go with i think and that probably is because that's the original one also Could that's be. why they picked it originally and that's why they've stuck with it for almost well, over 90 years now. You know, when whenever I think of the 270, I have a nostalgic feeling, okay? I My dad uh, had th 300 Savages and then 308s, and then he bought a 30 out 6 He never bought the 270. And it, I think it was because his brother-in-law, my Uncle Al, had one. <laughs> and, uh, and he couldn't be like Uncle Al. He had to have something different. But when Uncle Al passed away... Uh, I got all the empty shot, all the all the boxes of 270. These are the old old Winchester Super X boxes, and um, uh, and I still look at those with a lot of you know, gosh, these were probably bought in the 50s uh, when he got back from the uh, Korean War and stuff, and he bought these to hunt with, and uh, just beautiful guns though, and, and I've always admired them, and I do look forward to one day owning one. I just I haven't yet, and then oddly enough. Um, a few years back, one of our, uh, our another brother-in-law uh, lost his brother, and he handed down all the 270 stuff to us as well. So it's meant to be. No you know, one ever like, hands down like 44 Magnum stuff. Or, <laughs> sure or, they do. 
<laughs> but uh, but anyways, make a long story short, here it is. This is one of those calibers that we don't own one, and yet we're entirely set up with dies, bullets, uh, brass. It's kind of funny. It's uh, it's just one of those little quagmires we're in. So time to go shopping, I guess. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could say that. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go buy a 270, honey. Not today. But, uh, not today, anyway. I'm not <laughs> going to rule it out for tomorrow, but we'll see what we can do. Well, I'll tell you what, after uh, last week with that American rifle, I wouldn't be turned down to having one of those in 270. Oh, you, you know, you got a chance to shoot your Ruger American rifle last week. Uh, you, know, you got your gun. You, Jake went on the quest to build the American rifle, not spend a penny over $400. Yep. He bought a 308. Uh, right-handed American rifle. He put a uh, fairly inexpensive bipod on it, a uh, fairly inexpensive scope. Uh, it came with the rings, did it not? No, I had no, to purchase the rings. Yeah, purchase rings. But you did keep the total price of the gun under four hundred dollars. And and last the, weekend, yeah, sighted well, it in for the. F- and now, just to be honest with you, those rounds that you sighted it in with, you hand loaded. I hand loaded all those rounds, and they were. Uh, from a coffee can of bullets that was given to me that were in terrible shape, and I had to tumble them to get them to look good. So the chances of you shooting cloverleaf groups with that thing... Four-shot cloverleaf groups. Under the size of a quarter. I was astounded oh, when no, those rounds no, did it. Not under the size of a quarter. Perfectly touching to form a circle. Yeah, you... It, yeah. Perfectly well, blew out. Yeah, yeah, you, you don't have to say perfectly. You had good groups with it. It was a, They were all under the size of a quarter by the time you got it honed in. Which only took a few shots. I think and three shots. Three and we shots, had and you had a perfect bull, and then you stretched it yep. and made it a clover leaf, which was four, a small clover leaf. A four shot clover leaf. Yeah, yeah. It's a lucky clover leaf. There you go. It was, yeah. Could have been luck. Could have. Well, but no. my point no. is. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, the target wasn't feeling lucky. <laughs> the target was 13 feet from him, and yeah. he did it. <laughs> no, it was. Yeah. Target was quite a ways away. But, uh, but it was a good time, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, I could see you doing that with a 270. I think well, so. Only it'd be smaller holes. Yeah, it would be. Because you're talking 277 to... Yeah, 308. 308. Okay. Now, hey, on that note, what? We have to go to commercial break. We do break. have to go to commercial break. So, Kevin, can you take us away? We'll be right back with more of The Gunsmith Show. Man's got to know his limitations. You just can't spend a whole day at the gun store anymore. Thankfully, the crew at Williams Gun Sight Company has created the best way to spend the day at the gun store by doing it online. WilliamsGunsight.com is the way to shop for your used handguns, rifles, shotguns, and more with thousands of guns in stock for your total gun shopping experience. Check out WilliamsGunsight.com and find your perfect match today. Attorney Timothy J. Cassidy is the pro-gun attorney that we here at the Gunsmith Show use. With more than 20 years of experience as a prosecuting attorney, law professor, and holding a past seat on the Genesee County Gun Board, Tim Cassidy is your pro-gun attorney. Contact Attorney Cassidy today at 810-569-5441 or email him at attorneycassidy at gmail.com. If you want your home to feel sound when you are not around, call Pal Alarm. To protect your safe keepings and stop anyone from peeking, call Pal Alarm. When the house gets locked down so you can get out of town, call Pal Alarm. Give Pal Alarm a call today at 810-908-8298. That's 810-908-8298 or palalarm.com. And now back to the Gunsmith Show with John and Jake Smith. All right, we are back. Um, We have... uh, we always have a lot of fun with the show, picking on all these subjects to talk about. And having a 270 today is just, it's been a long time coming. I mean, we've had the show on the air for over a year now, like a year and a half. And we haven't talked about 270s hardly at all. We haven't. But now, what? Well, no, go ahead. Go no. ahead. We did get a caller uh, over the break, and they asked a very good question. Yes. And, you know, and it's one of those questions that I'm, I'm going to carefully say... <sighs> There's a lot of choices to be had in ammunition and in calibers. And people always say, no matter, like when I first bought my first 35 Remington, my father bought me a 35 Remington because I wanted something more powerful than a 3030. Because your brother had a 3030. Well, 
yeah, that, but but I, <laughs> I I wanted something more powerful. So then I went to our local gunsmith, wh- who was in Ortonville, was Mr. Walters, a very respected man in our community, and I said, I have this new thirty-five Remington, and here's my new Bushnell. No, it was a Tasco. It was, it was a Tasco scope, a three to nine by fifty scope. No, three to nine by forty, and he goes. Why didn't you get a 270 or a 30 out six and put this scope on it? It would have been smarter. And I said, well, I, I just wanted a 35. I just wanted a 30. I didn't, I didn't want to have a 400 yard, you know, deer slayer. I wanted a couple hundred yard deer slayer. But his words were, they still resonate with me today because there are guns out there to, for almost every purpose you can imagine. The caller's question today was, What's the difference between a 25 out six and a 270? Worlds, worlds of difference. Worlds of difference. Well, maybe not worlds of difference. <laughs> well, they're, they're similar. They're only, you're talking a 25 caliber to a 27 caliber. Well, so yes. There's very, very little difference. 25 out six was actually developed in a partnership with uh, with actually Whalen. Oh yeah. Because it was part of his 25, 35, and 40 calibers that he was going to put in the 30 out six car to build out of the 30 out six. His wild catting. Exactly. Him and uh, a guy by the name of Need- Needner did all this in the early 20s mm-hmm. and actually developed just about the same time as the 270. Right. But it was popular because the 250 3000 Savage it used the yeah. same bullets. Yeah, sure did. So it took an 87 grain bullet and pushed it at 3,500 feet per second. So it was a fast one. Very fast, very fast round, popular for long range antelope hunting. Yes. Uh, and it'll actually a 120 grain bullet too, 3,200 feet per second. So it's a little bit smaller bullet than the 270. Yeah. But it goes faster. So yeah, I guess it's a trade-off. You know right. how fast you know how fast you need a gun to go. Now, it wouldn't kick either one of them out of bed. I mean, they're very good guns, the 270 well, and the 25 out six. You know, we have a the, friend that has a, a 257 Roberts. Oh sure, in a classic pre-64 Model 70. Yeah. And uh, again, there's another. That's a, another. Uh, you know, wildcat cartridge that turned out to be a beautiful round. So, so the twenty-five out six was developed as a wildcat, and really, it was officially recognized by uh, by uh, Remington in the sixties. So, it took a long time for it to really take hold and be officially recognized as a cartridge by a right. It was it 1969, I think, Remington adopted it. Well, you know, it, here's a crazy, here's a here's a, uh, a cheapskate's version of what calibers to buy, okay? And I say that because I've been a cheapskate in my life. I've been one of those people raising kids and on a very tight budget, uh, keeping my marriage together, keeping the trucks on the road, and trying to keep ammunition in the guns. Back when, you know, you when you're working 12, 14 hours a day, and you're going to go deer hunting at 4 o'clock in the morning, and you're going to drive up north, who's open all night long? Meyer. So I used to judge <laughs> what calibers I wanted to hunt with with what of ammunition was available at Meyer's. Now, when you go to Meyer and you went in down the ammunition aisle, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, you're, and you could grab a, a box of shells, 30 out 6 was there, 270 was there, 35 Remington was there, 308. And thirty thirty. Yeah, those were the five main that they carried. Um, Twenty five out six is more of a wildcatter. Okay, still a beautiful round uh, and a good one. Uh, it been, you know, twenty thirty years ago, you you would see three hundred Savage on there. You'd see different caliber thirty two Winchester Specials, eight millimeter Mausers. Um, these were all pi- seven millimeter Mausers. Are all popular rounds. So your choice in in what caliber is a personal choice it's a, it's like what kind of car you drive it's a personal choice so let's talk more about the 270 though thanks caller for calling in hope that answered your question hope it informed the listeners I think now it did uh talking about the 270 like we said we really can't talk about the 270 without talking about jack o'connor right it's probably the most important reason for the 270 becoming the success that it is today is because of him uh, he was a shooting editor of outdoor life magazine for 31 years author of more than 10 books, and in 1925, he purchased his first Model 54 Winchester. Uh, But the one that he really took all over the world in the 270 caliber was a Model 70 Featherweight. Oh, no kidding. Uh, 1959, he purchased a Model 70 Featherweight in 270 
in a hardware store in downtown Lewiston, Idaho. Really? Yep. Now, he had used it since 1925. Right. So, But he just got an updated version. He bought the updated version. He probably version. darn near wore the other one out. And, and once he found out that the... 1963 models were the last they were going to do, and then, you know, they switched everything yeah, from the 70s. He said he bought many of them <laughs> before they changed. <laughs> Just so, in case you wear them out. You right. Know? Uh, his probably best-known quote about the 270 is this. If the hunter does his part, the 270 will not let him down. Well, that's good. You know, it is up to the hunter. You know, a lot of people blame the cartridge, but shot placement is everything about hunting. That's where practice comes in. Now, he instantly realized how accurate this Model 70 was. And uh, after kind of shooting it around a little bit, testing it out, he sent it to his favorite gunsmith by the name of Al Beeson of Spokane, Washington. What Beeson did then was he did a custom stock for the gun, and he had really fit the gun to make, fit the stock for the ergonomics of O'Connor. Oh, really? Really made the stock work for him. It had a different, uh, kind of a wider grip for his hands to work with it better. Mm-hmm. Tune the trigger, check the stock, did an ebony cap on the stock. Very, nice. just a beautiful gun. Made a classic looking sporter out of it. And he mounted a Leupold four power Mountaineer scope. Really? I'm not familiar with that scope. I don't think I've ever. It's a, it's I a know standard I've my eyes on four it. Look, power. It looks like a K4. It looks like a Weaver yes. K4, but it's a Leupold. Now, that rifle uh, weight was eight pounds even. And that's the, the featherweight. That's not bad. That's not bad because they they usually weigh right about you know s- you know six and three quarter to seven pounds for the rifle itself. So it's not too heavy of a scope and amount. Right. The guy did a good job. Now, uh, Jack O'Connor passed away in 1978. Right. And his son inherited the rifle. His son's name is, is Bradford. Now, interestingly enough, that rifle is on display today at the Jack O'Connor Hunting Heritage. An education center in Lewiston, Idaho. No kidding. The That's gun is cool. right there. But even better, his son still uses the rifle for hunting. <laughs> and That's good. He brings it out to let other people shoot it. If you go there, you want to shoot the gun. You set it up with the son. He's there. He'll take you out shooting with his dad's rifle. That's pretty awesome. So he say they say he does it in order to pass on the hunting heritage that his father had started for all those years. You know, starting with, in the you know. In the 30s. Yeah. I When I look back in, in uh, my life and in my travels and going to gun museums, seeing a gun in a museum, it's sure, it's great to see them. But doggone it, they, you know, they deserve to go out and get shot too, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like when we went to um, uh, Springfield, Missouri and went to the NRA. The Sporting Arms the Museum. The Sporting Arms Museum at Springfield last year. Well, this year. Uh, the walkways. The, the staircase. The banisters for the staircase and all the balusters are muzzle loaders, working muzzle loaders. Absolutely beautiful. Every one of them is a work of art, and here they are welded together. Welded together to make the staircase. That's when you know you have unlimited funds. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, some, you know, probably the Peterson family or something probably left a ton of money for them to do that or something. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, anyways, so um, uh, more about Jack O'Connor. Tell us more, Jacob. There's a lot of stories about Jack O'Connor. Yeah. Known for, you know, how many books do we have that have his name on oh, it? Oh, sure. My favorite books are his The Big Game Animals in North America, that big yep. white bound book. By Jack O'Connor. And the the pictures, the stories, everything about the different game and animals. I hunted basically all over the world. I took the 270 on, I think, two African safaris he took it with. And then that's when they started doing the game restrictions. Yes. But, Here's an interesting story about O'Connor, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the 270, but it's about his last rifle. Uh, in 1977, Jack O'Connor purchased a Ruger Model 77 in 280 Remington. Ah, the 7 millimeter Express. That's right. Now, he sent it back to Al Beeson in Spokane, Washington, and he actually put the exact same stock on it as the Model 70. Really? Uh, everything the same. Same scope. Same everything. It was a beautiful French walnut stock. Did everything with this matte bluing. It's called the black velvet bluing, non-glare finish. Put the Leupold 4 power on it. But Jack O'Connor died before the rifle was completed. Oh, no kidding. Now, of learning of his death, Al Beeson traveled to Idaho from Spokane. 
and to go to the funeral. And he said, well, I was going to drop a couple 270 rounds in his casket. Yeah. That way, which he says, whichever way you go, Jack, this way you have some rounds, my friend. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And then he realized he was going to be cremated. Oh. <laughs> so he said he oh. didn't want his friend to go out with a bang, <laughs> so he decided not to put the cartridges <laughs> in the casket. Oh, 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 that's a funny story. Well, you know, uh, that's a nice gesture, though. You know, I've seen people leave... A spoon in caskets so that they have, you know, a spoon for dessert wherever they go. Uh, I've seen golf balls so that they never are there without a ball. And a couple of rounds makes a lot of sense. That's a good one. Remember that, folks. That's a good one. As long as they're not going to be creamy. Exactly. Exactly. Well, that's an inter- interesting <laughs> story, Jacob. I appreciate you sharing that one with me. That one just about put a tear in my eye. All right. Well, let's go to commercial break. And uh, come back. We got more to talk about. So uh, fill that coffee up. It is the Gunsmith Show on Saturday morning. So here we are. If you want your home to feel sound when you are not around, call Pal Alarm. To protect your safe keepings and stop anyone from peeking, call Pal Alarm. When the house gets locked down so you can get out of town, call Pal Alarm. Give Pal Alarm a call today at 810-908-8298. That's 810-908-8298 or palalarm.com. Attorney Timothy J. Cassidy is the pro-gun attorney that we here at the Gunsmith Show use. With more than 20 years of experience as a prosecuting attorney, law professor, and holding a past seat on the Genesee County Gun Board, Tim Cassidy is your pro-gun attorney. Contact Attorney Cassidy today at 810 569 5441 or email him at attorneycassidy at gmail.com. You know, this is John Smith from I Can Build That. Every building has a roof, and peace of mind comes from having a good roof. That's why the I Can Build That team trusts DuraGuard Roofing for all their commercial roofing needs. So if your business needs a new roof, call DuraGuard Roofing at 691 691- 9243. That's 691 9243. Free estimates, free inspections. That's DuraGuard Roofing. We trust them. You can too. DuraGuard Roofing, 810 691 9243. And now back to the Gunsmith Show with John and Jake Smith. If you'd like to talk to John or Jake, call now 810 743 8255. All right. If you haven't been listening, good morning. This is the Gunsmith Show, and uh, here it is uh, uh, better than quarter to the top of the hour. Now we're getting in close to uh, uh, Mike Gaylord coming on the air here in a bit. So, Jacob, as we're talking about the – today we're talking about the 270 Winchester and specifically Jack O'Connor and how he influenced uh, kind of our way of life. That's uh, right. I know it's – what a what a what a, a step into our past to think about Jack O'Connor and those old uh, you know the books and how the immortal writings basically of of his works in those books yeah uh, changed a lot of folks changed yep. a lot of thinking about how to hunt you know because this country in the Buffalo days was forty five seventies and and forty four caliber guns and then now we're all the way down to a two seventy a uh, smoking fast round and honestly there's uh, there's a lot to be said for that cartridge and that caliber. Now, since then, since this came out, the 7mm Remington Magnums have come out. The, the Of course, the 280, starting with the 7mm Mauser. Right. But these guns have been created uh, as really high-performance rounds. They really are. They, they well, really... And even the 270 Super, the Winchester Short Magnums. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, you've got these shorter actions that really match almost the same ballistics and and can even exceed because right. they've got stronger the, the chambers because these guns whenever you're dealing with the old guns they can't they they uh they have to be very careful because they can't exceed the pressures that the old guns can handle compared to the new gun yep. with the new technology because if they exceed it they might you know unless you have a wildcat gun yourself and have it custom built then you can play with your gun a little bit and work on those pressures well, and make even faster rounds. We had to check on that when I had my 35 Whalen made. Yes. I used an, a, it, w- it had already been sporterized. I didn't ruin it. Somebody else did. 
<laughs> it was a Springfield, 1903 Springfield. Uh, but it was actually, it was made in, in the late 30s. Yes. So it wasn't too far back where the metal was brittle. It was in the right period, um, and we had to check and make sure that it was still safe to to have this gun chambered for that large of a cartridge. Right, right. And it was, but it then, was. You, then you put a good barrel on it. So what barrel we, did you we, put? We put a uh, Shillin. Shillin? Shillin barrel. Shillin barrel in 35 rem. 35 Whalen. And, uh, and done right. So, I mean, with all these guns, uh, you can, you know, it, it doesn't, when you think about it, you can build one of these guns for the same price as a really good set of tires on a four-wheel drive truck. You know what I mean? And those tires are going to wear out, but this gun's never going to wear out. So when you weigh it out, I always try to weigh out things to automotive costs, you know, or the amount of money you'll lose the second you turn the key on that new Chevy truck. You could <laughs> you could have a, a, a Jack O'Connor special. Well, you could have a Jack O'Connor special if we were back in the year 2012, which takes us to our gun of the week. We need some music after that. I'll I'll hum. Do 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 do. <laughs> gun okay. of the week. So what is the gun of the week? Gun of the week is the Winchester Model 70 Special Edition Jack O'Connor model. Wow. What year was it made? 2012. It's only a couple years ago. That's right. And it came out with the the Jack O'Connor Special. Now, uh, wh- what what is it? Model 70. Model 70, basically a somewhat a duplicate of the original rifle that he had. I shouldn't say original. What his gun looked like after it was customized. Okay, after it was customized. Beautiful walnut stock. Yes. Black ebony cap. Mm-hmm. Uh, the skeletonized butt plate, skeletonized grip, uh, grip plate, and then the the bottom side of the the receiver. The hinge plate. The hinge plate. The trigger guard. Well, the trigger guard has his his signature in nickel on it. Oh no, kidding. Yep. I like that. That's classy compared to gold. See? Nickel's cool. Well, wait a second. That's the next. There's, okay, there's, yeah. I'm sure there's gold in there, but the well, signature and The bottom of the magazine floor plate. Yes. Completely engraved with rams. Yeah, that's what he was yeah, known for hunting yeah. mount, uh, yep. the rams. Yep. And um, it had, of course, the high-polished Winchester bluing. Yes. Featured a pre-64 action from a win- from Winchester. Yeah. Three-position safety. Raised cheek piece. Everything. They even put the the special Pachmeyer pad behind the skeletonized plate. Really? Yeah. Wonder why. Uh, better recoil. Uh-huh. Came with special edition tags. All the stuff that goes on the gun to tell you that it's a commemorative edition. Sure. Uh, and they actually said it was one of the most sought after commemorative editions they've ever oh, done. I can imagine. Because the difference is when you do a commemorative edition on. Picture okay, somebody my age. Yeah, if you, oh, yeah. If, if you do a commemorative edition for Teddy Roosevelt, I don't know. Yeah, he's a president, but you know, there's, you know, he didn't right. write in magazines for thirty five years. He right. hunted in Africa, and in, in, in the age of the guys that read Jack O'Connor, exactly. are now at that point in their life where they're ready to purchase a fine, refined exactly. work of art like this. That's why they are. That's why they did the Roosevelt commemoratives in the seventies. Yes, because people then remembered him. Yes, now it's. O'Connor to him, and I'm sure right. in 40 years they'll do a Craig Boddington commemorative. Yeah. Well, you know, they, they do commemoratives on everybody, it seems, but the some of the companies go a little overboard. They do. I saw a John Wayne, didn't I see a John <laughs> Wayne 44 Magnum uh, Ruger Blackhawk, a Super yeah. Blackhawk, and I'm like, yeah, it doesn't really make sense to me, you know? But, uh, you know, a, a see, John I, Wayne I should be a, a, a 4440 or a 45 Colt. Which Winchester did the lever yeah, action? With, but it needs to be a finger grooved, uh, uh, single action army, right? Four and five eighths barrel. You know, keep it simple, keep it nice, and um, and it'll all work out just fine. But you know, a Ruger 44 Magnum Super Blackhawk in a John Wayne commemorative gold plated. I don't think so. Let's talk more seriously well, here. They he did they did offer a higher grade with gold inlaid rams on the bottom. Okay. Fully engraved receiver. That's fine. And on the side of the receiver was that quote about the two seventy. Oh yeah, a, a rifle will do what it's a hunter does his part. The two seventy will not let him down. That's right. And that's true. Good gun. Good round. Now, MSRP on these uh, in two thousand twelve or nineteen hundred. All right, in 2012. Now, if you now find MSRP one now. MSRP is the manufacturer's suggested retail price. That's right. But how much are they going for now, Jacob? 
If you can find if one. If you can find one on an auction site, they're upwards of 4000 Wow. Now, good let's say you wanted to start just like O'Connor did in 58. Yes. You want to go pick up your Model 70 Featherweight. You can't really do it at your local hardware store anymore. Right. Um, well, you might be able to. You might be able to order it. There might be an FFL dealer. Might be. You know, just got to check. You're right. Right. Uh, so you want to go pick out your Model 70 Featherweight and 270. Sure. MSRP on one of those today is $939. So you should be able to get it for about 800 you Maybe should. Eight, maybe 850 Depends on what, you know, th- what your dealer is going to deal with you on. But, you know, MSRP is always a little bit higher. But, you know, look at what you can get because I we look at almost all guns as somewhat of an investment. Some guns are tools and you use them and, you know, and they're not usually very expensive. The ones that you pay a little more money for can certainly go up in value. And, uh, and I know I'm not alone in that thinking. I know a lot of you think the exact same way. Now, with the 270 and that Jack O'Connor special, or I mean, honestly, even if I look at a Remington 742 and it says 270, I think of Jack O'Connor. It's just it's synonymous, it, and it's it's like 44 Magnums and Dirty Harry. You know, that's exactly. what you think about. You know, exactly. There's certain cartridges throughout the history of guns. When, when I lo- believe it or not, and stupidly, when I even look at a uh, an M1 Garand, yeah, I think of General George S. Patton because of his quotes. Well, you know, they, no. they go to get, he probably, he might never even have fired one, but he thinks it was the greatest battle weapon ever devised. And it, at the time it certainly was, and it still might be, you know, the AR 15s have gone nuts, but just think about it. That is still a workhorse of a gun. Weighs a ton. Weighs a ton. I wouldn't, kicks like a mule. I wouldn't want to carry it across the continent, <laughs> but no, I wouldn't want to jump off a ship with it in my hands. <laughs> yeah, it's an anchor. <laughs> it is an anchor. But, um, but anyway, so interesting talk today, Jake. I appreciate your efforts on uh, bringing up the information on the 270 and uh, on Jack O'Connor's Model 70 as well. This gun of the week, this uh, Winchester Model 70, the Jack O'Connor Special, if you can find one and get your hands on it and can afford the financing, I would <laughs> I would grab yes. one if I could. You can sell a kidney or two. You know, you never know where you run into this stuff. And uh, You know, you, you can you know, you keep your eyes out or put it on the want list at Williams and you might find one. You bought that. You bought your first three or five Whalen at a gas station in Wellston, Michigan. Yeah. It, you know, it just happened to be a commemorative rifle sitting on the gun shelf. Yeah. You went in one day and was like, well, huh. You know? <laughs> I think I'll take this one. You never know what you're going to find. Exactly. I, remember, the, 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 remember that Winchester I bought at the Dublin store? That's right. I was. We went into the Dublin store, which is it was the jerky headquarters of northern Michigan for like 20 years. And uh, Dublin's just outside of Manistee. Uh, I believe in Mason County, and um, and beautiful gun shop, a lot of fun. They got an archery pro shop there, fun place to go to. And there was a Winchester Model 94 Big Boar yeah. in 444. Never even seen one before, and they <laughs> had two of them. And the price was ridiculous. I was like, yes, I'll take it. And uh, um, I sent, I, I, it with, I've done with a lot of guns. I killed one deer with it and sold it. And boy, did I screw up because that was such a limited edition. It is tripled in price. So I screwed up. But say that one more time. What did you do? I'm a wonderful person. Okay. <laughs> well, that's about it for us for this week, folks. Well, hey, uh, come out next week. Sunday is the gun show at the Davis and Knights of Columbus Hall. That's right. We will be there. We will be there. Should be a lot of fun. Swing by Williams Gun Site and, come, and then come on over and see us at, at the gun show at the Davis and Knights of Columbus. That's right. So. Uh, until next week, don't forget to find us online at thegss.com. Find us on Facebook, four words, The Gunsmith Show. And uh, if you need to send us an email, that's right, shooter at thegss.com. Until then, I'm John. I'm Jake. And I hope you have a great week. Shoot straight, shoot often. Get out to the range and enjoy your sport.